Welcome to An Oral History of the Church. I'm Adam Christman. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational church history podcast, coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get started with the last episode of Volume 2. We've been going for a little while on this volume, so let's recap what we've covered. We've covered the broad schools of thought of historiography, looking at the a cyclical view or a progressive view mm -hmm. or the Marxist view. And then we offered a Christian historiographic perspective. Uh, not saying that you can't be a Christian and use those other perspectives, but right. there's something that Christianity brings to the table. Right. Minimalist view versus maximalist view and why that's relevant to the study of the historical texts within the Bible and so on. We examined the three canons of history. Uh, canon, again, we're not talking about the uh, a howitzer, we're talking about the measuring <laughs> stick. <laughs> That's right. These are the rules of what it means to write history. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about primary and secondary sources and distinguished between those. Uh, we plugged the library with uh, tertiary sources. Uh, <laughs> uh, so keep your reference librarian happy and, and busy. Uh, and busy. Come <laughs> by and use the tertiary sources. Um, we took a minute to talk about so social sciences and the cont contribution and distinction between the social sciences and history. Mm -hmm. Um and we talked about history writing in terms of genre and method and all the things that come along with that. We've decided that we should give you an example of what it is to write history. We've talked around all of this, but we haven't actually just jumped in and grabbed a good example of, of someone who's written history well. Right. And so we want to share that with you. Yeah, so... What Jonathan suggested was uh, a chapter from a book by a scholar named Gerald Bray. Uh, his last name is spelled B-R-A-Y. The book is titled Augustine on the Christian Life. What we'll discuss here in this uh, part of the episode is his first chapter in that book, The Life and Times of Augustine. Um, uh, I have a bit of a obsession with, uh, Augustine, uh, <laughs> probably not all, probably not the healthiest of <laughs> obsessions. <laughs> it's possible. Um, definitely. Possible. I've, I've read the confessions seven times now. Um, wow. So I've got one and a half. <laughs> uh, so he's an important person to me and i've read other works by uh gerald bray before uh, i find him to be a good and enjoyable historian and so because i like him i like augustine and i like this series um all of the other books in this series follow this general methodology. It's a, a series put out by Crossway. Um, I think the most recent one is Wesley on the Christian life. Mm -hmm. um, if you're wanting to read um, popular biography, uh, this is a good set based on some pretty solid scholarship. Yeah, that's right. And so as we discuss it, you may want to uh, either pause this episode and grab yourself a copy and read chapter one, or you, we could just roll with it and you can uh, hear us talk about it. Um, we will discuss it in such a way that you don't have to have read it, but it, uh, it certainly could help if you've already read chapter one of this book 
by the time you hear us talking about it here in a moment. So first thing I'd like to start out by reading something that's not in chapter one. <laughs> Cheater. Uh, <laughs> uh, he says at the very end of his preface, the t- details of Augustine's life are known mainly through what he tells us himself or from what his disciple and biographer Posidus has told us. Modern scholars generally accept that information, this information as factual and it is seldom if ever questioned. For precise details, see Alan Fitzgerald, Augustine Through the Ages, an encyclopedia, and Peter Brown, Augustine of Hippo, a new biography. Uh, these are going to be more scholarly works, mm-hmm. and there's one place where I would disagree with uh, Dr. Bray on where there's some scholarly questioning on um, Augustine and his life and theology, um, but it's mainly regarding the Donatist controversy. And even that, it's... Yeah, now I'm getting lost in the weeds. The yeah. Donatist controversy is complicated. Well, it is. Uh, and we could talk about that some if you want. Um, but perhaps perhaps we should move on to getting into kind of the overall flow uh, or sense yeah, of let, chapter let's one. Let's get in. Let's get into the overall flow. Yeah. So we have this information because of predominantly the confessions. Right. And he starts out with uh, Augustine's life and um, his family upbringing and culture. Mm -hmm. Augustine's father was a pagan. His mother was a Christian. We don't know whether they got married before she was a Christian or not. Uh, It's not a marriage of love, but it's a marriage of uh, social social advancement. Uh, We have this tendency as moderns to read on to ancient texts our perspective. Right. Right. and as much as I'm sure Patricius cared for Monica um, and his son, mm-hmm. the idea of romantic love, of of your spouse being the emotional center uh, of your life, that just wasn't a, a thing. Right. Um, and I do think this may have been a contributing factor on... Uh, some issues we'll see in Augustine's life later. Uh, Mm -hmm. Also, he highlights that uh, Christianity had just become a legal religion uh, in 313. Uh, Right. I believe that was just uh, a little bit before um, Augustine's father was born. So it had been about a generation before Augustine came around that Christianity was legalized. Correct. And he doesn't go into it much in his chapter because he doesn't need to, but I feel it is important to note that the legalization of Christianity at that time did not automatically mean the institution of it as the official state religion in the same moment. It was not one big <clears throat> executive order sitting on his desk that made the emperor, you know, sign they, you know, his advisor got him to sign this without reading it and then, you know, he made it both legal and the state religion. That's not exactly how it worked. Uh he does go into a little bit of detail related to that in this chapter, but um, his main focus, of course, is providing a biography of Augustine. So um, uh, that doesn't come up too much in the in in the chapter, but I don't know. It, it kind of it, it it's one of those things. It kind of gets under my skin a little bit when people say it was legalized <laughs> and made state religion at the same time. Such a silly thing to get uh, tripped up over, but 
Uh, that's what I think about. <laughs> it, it's it's a distinction that's important when we get to the um, uh, to the Donatist movement. Yeah, uh, because that's about the time when things are beginning to the state is beginning to pay a little more attention to what's going on in Christianity. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most important characters for uh, the confessions um, is Augustine's mother. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time she is portrayed as almost an idealized Christian woman. <laughs> uh, yeah. She sings him hymns. She provides for him to be able to be baptized, although he isn't able to. He, he rejects it. Um, Augustine rejects the baptism as a child. Right. Um, and just as a reminder, she, in case there's anyone listening to this who is not familiar with it, the confessions were written by Augustine. Just to just to make sure we get that out there explicitly, this is his own uh, essentially autobiographical work. Which, by the way, Augustine is almost kind of like the father of autobiographies. But anyway, so this is from his perspective, which is why all of his mother's contributions are kind of hagiographic uh, in a way. Uh, she can do no wrong yeah, it, in the confessions. It's kind of a big deal in terms of genre. Mm -hmm. Nobody talked about um, themselves. He wouldn't, if you had asked him if he was writing an autobiography, he would have said, what's that? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> like, people did journals and records of um, their lives, but this is something different yeah and he would have seen it as an extended prayer right uh so it gets um it's named the confessions because he's confessing that god is god um, yeah so and what, it, uh, for a, a writer for a a, a, a guy who's a, uh, especially trained in rhetoric and um philosophy what better way for him to adore his god right than to write all of this kind of stuff down so it was just the perfect choice uh it was the is the right guy at the right time with the right motivation and the right output that just it's this little magical moment in the history of the genre of uh, biography and history. <laughs> there is one place where um, there are two places where I think Monica is not quite presented in mm -hmm. an idealized form. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to save that for a minute because I think that fits better when we um, in a minute. Uh, he he leaves um he goes to Carthage to learn. He leaves Carthage um, to go to Italy to uh, mm -hmm. to teach there. Uh, on Correct. his way to Italy, um, his mother tries to persuade him not to leave. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the two places. He brings her to a, a shrine and asks her to pray for him. And while she's in there praying for him, he runs off and jumps on the boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, he really wanted to make his own way. Also, not necessarily something I would recommend doing. Don't <laughs> say, yeah, mom, go into the church service. I'll be there and then go drive to Vegas. Right. I'll be back in a jiff. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> The, yeah, but he and Sinatra would have gotten along. You know, he did it his way. That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> While he's going on his travels, both in Carthage and in Rome, he encounters a number of religious groups. Um, Manichaeism. Um, 
he encounters the Hortensius, um, and he he finds that nothing is really satisfying. Yeah, uh, none of the teachers are able to give him good answers, so he meets up with Faustus, uh, the great teacher of the Manichees, and he realizes that he can't explain astronomy which is a problem because their system is based on reading of the stars mm -hmm. but if you can't if you don't understand how the stars move then you can't really that doesn't work yeah um, and it would just be just, like a, just didn't have any answers it would be like a christian minister who has no idea who uh you know where to find something in the bible um doesn't understand how the book of Joshua connects with the gospel, for example. That doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> this is not winsome. I'm going to look for something else. So, he, he eventually ends up in Rome where he meets Ambrose, mm -hmm. who is a remarkable bishop. Uh, he just moves through the ranks of the church quickly um, partially because of his spirituality and partially because he's just really an effective communicator mm. uh, and that was why Augustine sat in, sat in his sermons was he wanted to hear this really good speaker preach yeah. and it's between the preaching of Ambrose and the reading of the Book of Romans, um, right. that he becomes Augustine becomes a Christian. Um, right. Well, don't forget he dabbled some with Platonism right before. Yes, his he does. He, he does thought, deal you with. Know, it's it's very similar, right? Like there's they both have the dichotomies. Um. But I think I think he realized, even as he dabbled with Platonism, I think he realized the real, uh, the winsome truths of the Christian faith. As a, I mean, as a direct result of Ambrose, for sure. But um, I think that's why his Platonism was short-lived. The problem with Platonism... Hey, that's a good title. Is... You should write a book. <laughs> Um, the problem with Platonism is there isn't any real good reason for good to be, um, good to be good. There's, there's no grounding in its transcendence. Yeah. Uh, so he appreciates the... Um, the Platon, the Neoplatonic uh, observation that evil is a deficiency, mm -hmm. an absence of good, mm -hmm. but that still doesn't give. It doesn't completely fix the uh, urethro problem. Uh, I, though Augustine didn't call it that. Well, let's um, not dig he, too deep into that anymore. I think we yeah. should probably move on. Yeah. Point is, um, yeah, he he struggled and he looked and looked. But then there's this the most famous uh, passage from the the Confessions. So he's sitting in this uh, villa where he and his friends are trying to to find an answer uh, and to synthesize all of this. And he has the Book of Romans with him. And he doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And he hears a child's voice uh, calling out, Tole lege, tole lege. Uh, take, it, take it and read it. Um, take up and read. Um, mm -hmm. And so he grabs the, the book next to him, uh, the Book of Romans. And it says...
Uh, let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or to gratify its desires. Um, and then he can, uh, Augustine continues and says that uh, he read no more for he needed to, uh, to read no more. Uh, it's perfect. It's, it's the perfect passage for him to turn because it, and it, he touches on it, of course, in his chapter long biography, but that sums up Augustine's sinful problems. Like those two verses are like a one, two punch on Augustine's like view of himself and the life choices he made with his mistresses and everything. Um, it was, <laughs> It was like God rang the bell before they even entered the the boxing ring. It was over. Like that 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 pair of verses was perfect for that exact moment. So he he gets baptized at um, Easter. He pledges to join the ministry. Uh, his mom meets up with him. Is excited to see that. Um, you know, he's uh, he's converted. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, she's disappointed that she's only going to have one grandchild uh, when she finally catches up to him, because uh, at that point, celibacy in the ministry was uh, pretty standard in the West. Mm -hmm. um, right, and though Augustine wasn't married, he had had a son by his... Uh, yes. longest relationship with a mistress and then on the ride home he he loses his mom mm. and um, uh, shortly after he loses his son yeah uh, so this is really depressing yeah uh, but he becomes a, a priest they bend the rules a little bit to make him uh, move up the ranks quicker. Mm. Uh, yeah, in Hippo Regius. In Hippo Regius. Uh, and that's where he stays as uh, as bishop. Right. Uh, he works with the the other churches and the other smaller towns, but he, he stays there and preaches in Hippo Regius until... Uh, well, until they get invaded by the barbarians, and he dies during the siege. Mm. There are three big groups that he combats against. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is the Manichees, uh, partially because it was somewhat known that he was um, uh, a Manichee before his conversion. Um and so there we go. The second group is the Donatists. The Donatists were North Africans uh, who, because of uh, an issue of, of um, people betraying church members, um, they questioned the legitimacy of Catholic um Catholic ordination only they would only accept people who were ordained in this line that wasn't right um, among the lapsed wasn't among the lapsed yeah um, which we could go on about but don't do it which, Johnny Mac yeah. we got to keep going yeah. <laughs> I think his two critiques of Monica actually are thinly veiled criticisms of Donatistic worship. <laughs> I can't explain why. Uh, Maybe we'll do uh, a whole uh, volume about uh, digs in uh, hidden digs in history uh, insults <laughs> packed into autobiographical or polemical works. <laughs> and then the final group he did argues against is Pelagius um, right. and 
Pelagianism is about whether or not you can be saved apart from works. Um, mm -hmm. Pelagius thought that Christ was just a really good example. And Augustine says, no, death of Christ is efficacious, that it actually right. does something for people. The remainder of the chapter uh, looks over Augustine as an author. His contri contribution is writing autobiographical work. Right. Most especially, of course, the Confessions, mm -hmm. although there are other letters uh, along the same lines. He looks at his contribution to philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. Some of what we have has been lost. Um, his exegesis and his hermeneutical method. Uh, I want to camp there. I won't. Uh, <laughs> Called on Christian doctrine, but let's move on. Yes, because uh, he Adam knows what will happen if he lets me camp there. Yeah, we're uh, trying to do which, all this in one episode, folks. Yeah. <laughs> he does have separate stuff on systematic theology, but he never writes a systematic theologian. I mean, he never writes a systematic theology. Right. Um, and he writes his apologetics. Um, and then he write some pastoral concerns um so this chapter sort of sets out for the reader of um of the broader book this is who augustine is yeah and then the next chapters look at look in more depth at one particular angle of augustine's life so none of this is wrong none of you know nothing that he includes is even really hotly debated um anything that is even vaguely contentious he uh brave avoids yeah uh, because that's not what he's trying to do he's trying to give an easy quick introduction to who is this important person in uh, Christian history, right? And why can we trust that uh, we know anything about him? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we know stuff about Augustine because he wanted to write about himself. He wrote about himself, yeah. and it's been passed down. Right. Uh, and then there was that one there, biography, and there was the one biography, which is highly reliant on the Confessions. Right true we we know what we know we either have to accept that he's telling the truth or we if we doubt him if we approach augustine with historical minimalism well right what so the, this is what we have to work with right i think uh bray succeeds in giving a, a succinct but flavorful biography of Augustine in a single chapter. Um, the I like that he he has the section on the the different works that Augustine produced. Um, in fact, the, uh, Bray wrote this sentence. He said, "No ancient Christian writer has left us a larger corpus of writings than Augustine." Uh, he qualifies that by saying that uh, the ancient writer Origen is a close second, al although he may have technically more pages. Uh, ultimately, it seems to be on a narrow, li a more narrow list of subjects. Oh, plus Origen was uh, murdered as a heretic, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Augustine <laughs> died in honor, and. Um, and he wrote on a lot more topics than Origen did. And then uh, he, he, he wraps it up with a, a basic beliefs section that's pretty, it's pretty short. But I think he's uh, accurate to sum up uh, Augustine's beliefs and contributions as primarily affecting the doctrines of the Trinity, uh, the doctrine of Christ, Christology, and the doctrine of salvation, soteriology. 
Exactly. Um, he paints him as uh, basically a, a fourth, fifth century inerrantist. Which that's pretty fair. Yeah. The statement may betray more of a twentieth century end of the twentieth century, beginning of the twenty first century concern, but it's also fair to ask the questions we want to ask, right? Um, if we can try and come to a conclusion about it, why not try? Even if Augustine wasn't interested in that particular um, argument or issue, he still had a stance that relates to it. So um, Bray gives us that. Um, yeah, I thought it was uh, interesting about... Um, the 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 little note he has on the disagreement between Augustine and Jerome about the usefulness of the apocrypha. Yeah, that is. If there was a East Coast West Coast theology <laughs> battle of uh, the uh, post Nicene era, that was it, and they. <laughs> They are the giants of uh, their day. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's in a way, it's almost a shame that it gets such a brief uh, coverage in this chapter. But um, as we've said so many other times so far, that wasn't really his focus. Uh, his focus was was over here, giving us. Uh, well, I don't want to say it again. You've already summed it up. Um, anyway, it's just interesting to see that difference between Jerome is presenting the fact that the Apocrypha is useless essentially because the people of the Old Testament, the Jewish people had decided against incorporating it into the Old Testament where Augustine said that it was useful even if it was not the same as canonized scripture. Because of the breadth of things Augustine wrote about with with good insight and the the fact that most of his corpus has been handed down he's sort of a, a scholarly hole you can fall into and never get out of <laughs> and many uh, have and many god, have god yes. bless their souls <laughs> Uh, so in case you want to join uh, this fearless crew of uh, people forever going down that path, uh, uh, I, I think we've mentioned him in this before, uh, Friends Rise of Christianity um, and his Donatist Church. Uh, that's a great way into one slice of mm. um, Augustine and his North African world. Uh, hopefully somebody listening to this says, that sounds interesting, and maybe we have uh, yet another member of that uh, austere <laughs> portion of uh, Christian historiography. <laughs> You're like you're like a siren on theological rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> calling these reading sailors to come and crash upon the endless pages of Augustinian writings and uh writings about Augustine. Some of which is still not translated from Latin. <laughs> I bet that's the first time anyone's ever described you as a siren, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes it is. <laughs> Hey, I did something for the first time that nobody else has ever done. Dissertation. Oh, I win. Done. <laughs> My contribution to humanity is complete. The other thing we would like to do, we want to, to talk about how we have done history. Uh, right. Adam and I both uh, participated in a historiography class. Uh, we didn't want just this to be uh, us tooting our own horns, uh, <laughs> but we, we did want to share some of the fruit of our labors, and so we will be taking a look at Adam's uh, paper on an event in the life of Jesus. 
Uh, That's so right. a little narrower than what we looked at on you know, this big chunk of uh, Augustine's life and even bigger body of literature. Now mm-hmm. we're looking laser focus. What happened here right. at this one place? So um, it's the height of narcissism in this podcast, but I'm going to go ahead and read this. So what follows is going to be the title and then the text of my paper. The title is Mark 7, 24 through 30, Jesus' Encounter with the Gentile Woman as a Historical Event. Uh, Yes, that's not the most creative name, but uh, like Jonathan said, laser focus. Now, this paper is uh, almost three and a half years old, so it was kind of like opening a time capsule when I reviewed this the other day to get ready for this episode. Uh, But here we go with the introduction. The stilling of a storm, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the healing of a blind man's eyes, and the exorcism of a Gentile woman's daughter at a distance. Each are examples of miracles attributed to Jesus in the canonical Gospels. As with any academic conversation about a narrative passage in the scriptures, each of these are worth evaluating as genuine historical events. This paper argues that Mark 7, 24-30, the meeting of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, whose daughter is demon-possessed, is a historical event based on several arguments related to historiographical analysis. It begins with the definitions of gospel as a genre, including whether or not they pretend to present historical truth claims, and the difference between parable and miracle stories, followed by a brief explanation of the passage. Next, a few thinkers across history are surveyed for their interpretation of the historicity of this event. Two scholars are then examined for their treatment of the gospel's miracle stories, one a minimalist and one a maximalist. Finally, the study ends with the argument on why Mark 7, 24-30 genuinely happened as a historical event in the life of Jesus. What is a gospel? Any given genre is distinct from another because of its particular set of characteristics and the particular entry within that genre at hand. Formal features, author's intention, compositional process, setting of the author, setting of intended use, and contents constitute the characteristics that should be examined for determining genre. In the case of the gospels, there is some debate on whether they are a distinct genre or whether they are a subgenre of another genre in Greco-Roman culture. Much of form criticism emphasized that the four Gospels, quote, embody the early Christian proclamation of the significance of Jesus and were written exclusively to serve this proclamation, end quote. Those who disagree generally focus on comparing the Gospels to one of three genres, chosen, choosing from biography, history, or novel. Hurtado discusses the basic factors involved making a good baseline with which to work. Hurtado establishes the narratives of the Gospels as not impartial accounts. They promote Jesus as a good figure and portray his enemies negatively. Given their interest in the narratives of Jesus' ministry and his death and resurrection, as well as their relatively unified portrayal, they are quite different from the apocryphal Gospels that only collect sayings attributed to Jesus, portray only Jesus' childhood, and which have different theological perspectives. Hurtado describes the Gospels as at least inspired by the very popular genre of Greco-Roman biographies of the first century, but he also describes them as a distinctive subgenre within that Greco-Roman genre. Justin M. Smith provides a four-part rubric by which any work of Greco-Roman biography, including the Gospels, can be sorted. He proposes ancient definite, in which the author writes without living memory of the subject and for a definite audience. Ancient indefinite, in which the writer writes for an indefinite audience. Contemporary definite, in which the author writes with the benefit of living memory of the subject and for a definite audience. And contemporary indefinite, in which the author writes for an indefinite audience. Using these categories, it is the contention of this paper that Mark's gospel falls within the contemporary definite understanding. 
Such biographies are about a person of significant interest, quote, who lived within living memory of the author and are directed toward distinguishable audiences, end quote. Eyewitness accounts are vital to contemporary passages. In addition, Smith describes the contemporary category with a comment on the personal nature of the subgenre. Quote, Often in this type of biography, there is a personal relationship between the author and subject that, trans that transcends a conventional interest in the subject as a moral example or person of interest. End quote. The only difficulty in Smith's model, as with others, as with the others, is that there is no general rubric to distinguish a hard line between a pericope as a historical event or not. This is the intention of each of the aforementioned scholars, as each recognized the ambiguity regarding historiography in Greco-Roman biography. Smith especially does not presume to claim any particular passage as a historical event or not. Certainly that is not the purpose of the cited article, but it is an indication of Smith's perspective on the loose nature of Greco-Roman historiography. Each of these scholars presume that there is a degree of historical truth claim within the gospel narratives, however, which leads the present study to the point of contention over Mark 7, 24-30. Each of the methods argued by these scholars allow Mark 7, 24-30 within the circle of historical possibility, by the virtue of its placement within a kind of Greco-Roman biography. One scholar is more specific. Philip L. Schuler makes a few assertions about history in his monograph. He claims, quote, Works may vary in topic, scope, and, to some extent, purpose. But the term history is applicable in each case, and each author appears to understand its designation, although each may differ over the specific content of history. Likewise, one cannot place arbitrarily restrictive definitions upon the type of biography to which these authors refer." End quote. Smith's model avoids the quote-unquote restrictive definitions that Schuler warns against. It also allows for a flexibility in the term history such that the accurate reporting of a historical event is a good possibility. Distinguishing Parables from Historical Truth Claims A historical truth claim is an assertion or description that is meant to communicate a story to the listener or reader that is based on one or more historical events or occurrences. A parable might at first seem very similar. It is worthwhile to distinguish between the two. A parable, quote, is an extended metaphor an implied comparison referring to a fictional event or events narrated in past time to express a moral or spiritual truth, end quote. In the canonical gospels, it is different in form from the narratives of Jesus' actions. A parable in the canonical gospels typically leaves motives unexplained, is usually taken from everyday life, though not necessarily realistic, a la the 10,000 talent debt in Matthew 18, is the instigator of thoughtful questions, such as, what do you think? And thus requires both the hearer to make a similar judgment about religious matters as well as to make a reversal in one's thinking. Most, if not all, of the parables are stories told by Jesus as he goes about his own story in the Gospel narratives. The encounter between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman does not carry any of the characteristics of parables. Her motive is quite clear. She wants an exorcism for her daughter, who is not with her at the moment. Jesus' motive is quite clear. His mission is to the Jewish people, so any miracle working he does among Gentiles is secondary. It is not a story of everyday life. It is extremely uncommon to have a demon-possessed child in one's family. More than that, there is no everyday life kind of milieu to the story. It is told in a straightforward manner, as if this is what happened to Jesus one day. No question is posited in this story by either of the speaking characters, nor is there a judgment to be passed by either the Syrophoenician woman or the reader. Jesus speaks about the priority of the Jewish people as a matter of fact. Rather than a parable, this pericope is one kind of miracle story. Most miracle stories in Mark are healings, but several are exorcisms. One is a raising from the dead, and there are five miracles regarding the natural world. Telford, based on the work of Boltmann, promotes a three-part structure for the synoptic miracle material using the terminology of healing to function for both healing and exorcism stories. 
The first part consists of, quote, the condition of the patient being recounted, the healing described, and the cure demonstrated, end quote. This narrative matches that criteria to the letter. The woman describes her daughter's condition in verse 26. The healing is described in verse 29, and the cure is demonstrated in verse 30. Mark 7, 24 through 30 is not a parable. It is one kind of miracle story, specifically an exorcism story. It is a slice from this particular kind of Greco-Roman biography, portraying the meeting of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman as a historical event. A brief description of the passage. Mark 7, 24 through 30 is quoted here in its entirety. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This miracle story fits Telford and Boltmann's structural form, though some of the details are quite different from the other exorcism stories in Mark. Firstly, the ethnicity of the recipient is Gentile, which marks it from the other exorcisms, with the possible exception of the man possessed by Legion in Mark 5, 1-20. Secondly, Jesus is reluctant to cast out the demon, whereas he has no hesitation in the other exorcism stories. Thirdly, it is remarkable that he exorcises the demon from a distance. A brief history of the history of interpretation, fictional event or historical event. Over the life of the church, different scholars held to different perspectives on the historicity of Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7, 24 through 30. Given the constraints of the present study, only two scholars are here surveyed, Origen. Origen, in his commentary on Matthew's version of this story, made some statements that show that he stands somewhat in a middling position on the historicity of the event between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. In one place, he treats Jesus' retreat from Jewish territory to Gentile territory as genuinely historical as a response to the Pharisees. On the other hand, Jesus' entire trip through the areas of Tyre and Sidon is treated allegorically. Adela Yarbrough Collins Some who see 7 verse 24a as redaction by the author point to Mark 3, verse 8, where the people from the region of Tyre come to Jesus as evidence that Jesus would not travel to Tyre. It simply functions to create a Gentile-centric setting. As to 7, 24 through 30, Collins says that it is a form of an objection quest, where the objection from Jesus must be overcome by her faith and persistence in order for the quest to be successful. It is merely a story that portrays the character of Jesus, while simultaneously justifying the predominantly Gentile composition of the church at the time of its inclusion in Mark. She does not hold that Mark 7, 24 through 30 represents a historical event. She sees this entire gospel as the end result of a long line of editors. A Minimalist Perspective Floyd V. Wilson wrote several noteworthy works in the field of New Testament studies. One of those is his A New Testament History, a book published in the mid-1960s. His section on the miracles of Jesus is relatively clear, giving a glimpse at a minimalist scholar's perspective on the alleged miracles of Jesus. In his subsection on The Miracles and Their Meaning, Filson deals with the maximalist view directly and quickly, though his language could be somewhat clearer. For example, his opening paragraph on the miracles includes the statement that, quote, for the gospel writers, the miracles are an essential part of Jesus' ministry, end quote. The very next sentence clarifies what the previous one left cloudy, quote, two things hinder their ready acceptance by, modern, by many modern readers, end quote. The first hindrance for Filson is, quote, that these stories are written in a pre-scientific or non-scientific atmosphere, 
and so to an age steeped in the thought forms of modern science, they seem discredited. End quote. He allows that the modern world does not know all things about science, but he does not release the principle of analogy here. He binds up the miracles in it quite nicely. The second hindrance is, quote, that some stories have grown in the telling, end quote. He uses a weak example in comparing Mark and Matthew's slightly differing accounts of Jairus' daughter. Whereas in Mark, she is on death's door, then dies before her father can get home. In Matthew, Jairus tells Jesus that his daughter had already died. For Filson, such an alteration from Mark to Matthew is a sign of making the story more than it was. To make the story more significant later, then, is evidence that it was not a genuine miracle originally. As is demonstrated below in the subsection on the maximalist perspective, personified by Craig Blomberg, the principle of analogy is demonstrated as a weak principle that cannot deny the possibility of miraculous events. The second hindrance holds no water whatsoever. A unique event occurring to a unique individual is no less likely to be genuine if the retelling of the story makes that unique individual stronger, smarter, or faster. Maybe the retelling of the story is an intentional deception, but the size of the fish in the latest telling does not negate the genuine existence of the original fish. A Maximalist Perspective Craig Blomberg is a clear and thoughtful voice in the debate over the historical reliability of the New Testament, especially the Gospels. In 1987, he published a high-quality monograph on the subject, which gave scholars a clear method for understanding the problems at hand as well as a possible method for solving those problems. This section will deal with this book in detail, focusing especially on the third chapter in which Blomberg handles the issue of miracles. Blomberg demonstrates that there are three issues behind the rejection of gospel miracles. The first is the scientific objection. He defines the objection thusly, quote, in short, the scientific objection to the credibility of miracles is that the discovery of the natural physical laws by which the universe operates has proved them impossible, end quote. Though he discusses science and faith rather broadly in this subsection, his solution to this objection is rather simple. Based on Blomberg's theistic worldview, presupposing an omnipotent personal agent, he is able to say, quote, Most defenders of miracles today, therefore, do not deny the validity of the regularities of nature. Instead, they deny that a miracle must be a violation of such laws, end quote. The second issue at hand is the philosophical objection, which stems out of David Hume's thought. Blomberg pulls four reasons out of Hume's works to show why a natural explanation is always more likely than a supernatural one. In addition, he points to a further point which, if all four of the previous arguments were proven false, Hume said would still prove his perspective. This final point is that the weight of probability would still favor a non-miraculous explanation of every extraordinary phenomenon. Blomberg shows that such reasoning was debunked at least as early as 1819, when the book Historical Doubts Relative to Napoleon Bonaparte was published by Richard Waitley. Waitley applied Hume's final point to the life of Napoleon, a unique individual for many reasons. Quote, Waitley demonstrated by it that one has no reason to believe that most of the accounts of his life are true, a conclusion which is patently absurd." End quote. The third issue at hand is the historical objection, which comes from the work of Ernst Trelsch. Specifically, Blomberg takes on the principle of analogy. This principle states, quote, that the historian has no right to accept as historical fact the account of a past event for which he has no analogy in the present. End quote. In response, Blomberg says that he paraphrases Wolfhart Pannenberg, quote, it is not the lack of analogy that suggests something is historical, but only the presence of an analogy to something already known to be unhistorical, end quote. With the problems regarding miracles generally addressed, Blomberg is free to presume the validity of at least some miracles, if not all those reported in the Gospels and Acts. His next subsection deals with the problem of identifying miracles as genuine, through asking what parallels to Jesus' miracles there are, if any, and how significant are they. He also asks after what the evidence is for the reliability of the gospel miracle stories, and how strong that evidence is. 
he surveys miracles in the New Testament Apocrypha, but finds them to grow out of heretical sects, like Docetism in the Gospel of Peter. He also examines Greek heroes, but ultimately denies that they truly qualify as parallels. Next, Blomberg looks at magic and magical writings, but ultimately rejects those as options for understanding Jesus' miracles. The only parallels Blomberg accepts are miracle workers from charismatic Judaism, though the issue of authority is quite different. In Blomberg's view, the miracles attributed to Jesus can be considered authentic as a result of two major evidences. It is because of their uniqueness, since no other miracle worker did quite what Jesus did, and because of their central purpose, which is to act as signs and indications that the Messiah has come, which Blomberg demonstrates through binding the miracles to Jesus' teaching as an inseparable combination. A case for Mark 7, 24-30 as a historical event. Several concerns have been raised as the historicity of Jesus' miracles in general. Blomberg's book is incredibly helpful in this area. Individual miracles still need discussion, however. A wide range of scholars were surveyed for their perspectives on this passage, and miracles in general. Their concerns are generally listed below and are then engaged before the present study and are then engaged before the present study makes positive assertions with regards to the passage at hand. Many scholars have raised concerns over the historicity of Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. First of all, any scholar who denies miracles based on the principle of analogy have a problem with this exorcism pericope from the start. Second, there is the concern that Mark does not seem to know his Palestinian geography, as he depicts Jesus following a zigzag, illogical course all over Galilee in these chapters in the Gospel. Third, the fact that this passage can and does encourage Gentile Christians to take encouragement because it depicts the Gentile mission as an activity stemming out of the life and ministry of Jesus. As discussed above, the principle of analogy is unable to deny the possibility of miracles. If miracles are possible, then not only is it possible that Jesus exercised demons from the Syrophoenician's daughter at a distance, but it is possible that Jesus really did predict the sack of Jerusalem in AD 70. This would allow for an early date for Mark, maybe as early as the 40s or 50s. An earlier date for this gospel would allow for Mark to have known Jesus personally, and for the vetting of the narrative of this gospel by eyewitnesses. Dealing with the second point, Mark utilized a loose structure to allow for his thematic points. Mark 7, 24-30 is set between the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. Quote, There is Mark's well-known sandwich technique of including one episode with the two parts of another, a form of chiasm or concentric structuring. End quote. The point of this loose structure with regards to the passage at hand is that Jesus is declaring the Gentiles clean and a part of the kingdom of God. Finally, the fact that this passage does encourage Gentile Christians in that way, and was probably intended to encourage them in that way, does not make it any less genuine an event in the life of Jesus. The case for the historicity of the event in 7.24-30 is already fairly well established, but there is one more topic to discuss that makes it stronger. In both versions of this passage, in Mark and in Matthew, Jesus is not only hesitant to exorcise the demons from the woman's daughter, he actually uses what can be called a racist term for Gentiles in the discussion. The inclusion of such dialogue is unflattering, to say the least. Such dialogue makes Jesus look less appealing to Gentiles, perhaps. The description of this demon-possessed girl as a dog is so harsh that Matthew softens it in his version, adding Jesus' statement about the Syrophoenician woman's great faith. Thus, Jesus looks better for complimenting her, and the racist term is counteracted by his strong compliment. Luke, however, writing for a Gentile audience, completely omits the passage from his gospel. The harsh strength of the term dogs for Gentiles as well as Luke's Gentile-minded writing, combined with his omission of the entire story, are strong indicators that this encounter was a genuine event in the life of Jesus. Well, Jonathan, that was my paper. Uh, you read it uh, before we sat down to record this just now. but uh, Or you read it again, I should say. You also read it back in uh, 2013. 
I have to say, uh, as much of a little time capsule moment as it was to reread this paper uh, in order to narcissistically put it out here on the podcast, it's also kind of embarrassing because I would I would completely rewrite this paper if I had to. Um, I still believe the argumentation, but I would present it very differently and organize it very differently. Um, however, that's neither here nor there. My main point was uh, in the paper that... Mark 7, 24 through 30, is more likely to be based on an actual historical event than not, regardless of whether it has a miracle story in it. I think maybe the best part of the paper is not so much my original thought as it is recounting what I learned about uh, an interaction with, with David Hume about history, historiography, and and how the the principle anal- of analogy can fail especially when you think about special circumstances special individuals the example that i i i um found and and used in my paper dealt especially with the unique events in the night in the life of napoleon bonaparte which is used kind of in reverse to quote unquote prove that napoleon bonaparte did not exist and didn't do any of the things that he did when in fact the person who argued that was a contemporary of that period, and there was no denying, of course, that Napoleon Bonaparte is a real person and did all of the things that the history books and primary sources show that he did. So the main point was about how Mark 7, 24 through 30, is most likely to be based on an actual historical event that includes the miracle of the exorcism, but is based on issues like this, this paints Jesus in a not so nice light. Um, the Sermon on the Mount paints Jesus in a very nice light. Or when he says, let the little children come to me. And in, um, one of the best loved stories about Jesus, where he rescues the so, uh, so-called adulterous woman in John 8 from being stoned to death, uh, although that has historical questions of its own. Um, those, those all paint Jesus in very uh, winsome lights. Um, those are the beautiful portraits. Those are the portraits where the individual is well lit and is um, posing in next to a, a beautiful vista or... Uh, a lovely bowl of fruit. Mark seven twenty four through thirty paints a portrait of Jesus in some standing in some shadow, in in kind of a a a, a filthy setting, not a clean setting or a beautiful setting like a hillside. The point of this metaphor is to bring up the fact that Jesus appears to use a term that was a racist term for Gentiles utilized by the Jewish people of the first century. Because uh, Jesus is shown using this this term, because the woman is granted her request based on her wittiness and uh, the fact that she's given dialogue in the story, all of these issues point to uh, the conclusion that this is based on a, a, an actual historical event rather than the opposite. As um, probably many of our listeners already know, in the first century it was more common, uh, it was almost ubiquitous that a false narrative, so a fictional narrative, or a uh, a dialectic kind of uh, work where you create two characters to argue back and forth in order to present the strengths and weaknesses of the two sides or what have you, um, that these would be men um, who would have strong points of view and winsome rhetoric, or if uh, the, the bad guy was being painted especially bad, he would be painted with really bad rhetoric. But the good guy, the side that the writer wanted you to agree with, would be 
painted in a beautiful light as a good person, a kind person, an understanding person, a wise person who knows better and um, is not un- unfair. Jesus may be presented in a light as that some people might think that's not cool for him to have said that. Um, and that's those those are the main pieces that that um, point towards the conclusion that this is based on a historical event, and and so I think that we should we should head that direction with how we treat it, that it is more likely to have been based on a real historical event than not. Whether uh, you know, regardless of the exorcism, you know whether the person reading this text and dealing with it as a historian believes that miracles are possible is actually kind of irrelevant in a way. Um, yeah. But go, go ahead, Johnny Mac, with your thoughts. The modern historian may want to dispute the cause of the, the healing, mm-hmm. but there's, there's not a way to, you know, we can't go back there with 20, 20th century medical equipment and see precisely how uh, this child was healed. Right. We don't have enough military grade plutonium for the DeLorean. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Libyans are still looking for me. True. Um, but. <laughs> Good luck. Stay safe. <laughs> uh, uh, no one would. The followers of Jesus wouldn't want to make up a story where Jesus is using a, a racial slur, mm-hmm. especially if you have, you go with the thesis that Paul is the creator of Christianity and he's got this, there's no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, right. you know, a racial slur throwing Jesus um, doesn't really fit, <laughs> fit that narrative. Right. Um, even if he's using it in a in a way that is testing the faith of this woman, it just it sets wrong. It right. would have set wrong in the first century. It would set wrong today. Exactly, and it, it, it also points uh, connects with um, the debate over the the order. Uh, the chronological order of the Gospels, when were they published? Um, the most common theory uh, today, of course, is that Mark was written first, and then um, people debate who came next after that, whether it was Matthew or Luke. And it makes it fits nicely with those who give Mark the chronological priority. Uh, this particular passage does, because in this passage, it's blunt. Jesus uses the racial epithet, and uh, nothing is 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 presented or curbed or framed within Mark's uh, version to soften the blow. It's just uh, boom; it just goes out, and then the pericope ends. In and I talked about this in the paper, but in Matthew's gospel, his version softens it where Jesus praises her great faith. So rather than just uh, the faith recognized in Mark 7, where Jesus recognizes her faith and says, because of your faith, your daughter is healed already. You can go home now. Um, In Matthew, it is a great faith that she has, which uh, is, it's very common to see interpretations that this is Matthew's way of softening the blow of the, the racial slur. And then Luke, who um, it's very commonly believed he wrote with the intention of a Gentile audience. Um, and I think that's a very safe bet, especially considering the um, proper name that he used when he addressed both the gospel and the, the book of Acts. But anyway, uh, he didn't include this story at all. Um, perhaps he was aware of it and thought, no, I'm good. I, I want to demonstrate to the Gentiles that that he is their savior too. Um, so it could fit with that uh, narrative of uh, considering Mark as the one written first. Um, 
in my own personal view, I believe um, Mark wrote a first edition, like a first draft, not really a first edition. He wrote a first draft while in Israel, Judea, and um, he and Matthew knew each other. Matthew read it, thought, this is really good. I want to get a copy before you leave for your missionary journeys with Paul and then later with Barnabas. Um, so he got himself a copy. Mark leaves for these missionary journeys. While he's traveling, he continues working on it. Matthew, meanwhile, takes what Mark has and says, awesome. But because I'm still here in Judea, I'm going to pad this thing out with more and more stuff to accomplish what I want to accomplish with my biography of Jesus. And so he... Um, he does that, and because he's not traveling, he and he's not using the remembrances of Peter, whom Mark probably did not see very often when he was out on his missionary journeys, until and unless he was doing so with Peter. Um, he got to sit down, you know, with people around him and just write all these stories down and put it in the order he wanted and so on. And so Matthew got his out first, so he... <laughs> he he published his book out on uh in Kindle edition, you know, before um Mark got his in print. But uh so I think that Matthew got his finished form out there first. And then Mark eventually said, "Okay, let's get this first draft into a final format." Got his final form and published his the way that he wanted, which is this more streamlined um uh, successive scenes, of just bam, 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 of the 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 movement of the gospel, and then sometime later Luke publishes his. Um, but I think it still fits in in that um, perspective on the chronological priority of the gospels as well, because Mark had the story, Matthew got a copy and said, "Okay, great," but I want to soften the blow a little bit because that's that's a little rough around the edges. I just realized there may be listeners concerned about what we think about the inspiration and writing of the scriptures, which could be its own volume. I'm just going to make a quick comment that Jonathan and I both hold to the inerrancy of scripture, uh, especially in the autographs, which we don't have. Nobody has any copies of those. But um, just because we talk about a change between one gospel and another of the same story, that does not mean we have any less confidence in the scriptures as presenting authentic words and actions of Jesus. It may very well be that Jesus, out of Jesus' mouth came the phrase great faith when he addressed the Syrophoenician woman. That does not mean that Mark is deceiving us when he does not include the word great Likewise, if Matthew understood that Jesus meant something like great faith, that was kind of what he was talking about, that's how Jesus thought, then even if Jesus didn't use that word, it is fair to represent Jesus as saying it in that way, because it is true to Jesus, and is essentially what he meant, even if not exactly word for word what he said. I think I want to redirect our conversation slightly based on some of the things that you've touched on here. Sure. Um, Sorry, there's a whole rabbit hole it, I could go down with that. Oh, yes, I know. And there's a couple that I saw too, but I want to save those again for some other episodes. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's been common in New Testament studies that you touch on in your paper is... Um, is truth and falsehood connected to genre mm -hmm. uh, so boltman um had his demethylization program who wanted to make um everything in the gospels to be a myth mm -hmm. uh, or there's a sort of post boltmanian movement that wants to read some of the stories of Jesus as parables about Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you do a good job of showing that it is not the genre of parable. And I don't think that this 
at, at least this pericope pit fits the genre of myth. Mm-hmm. Um, there are hallmarks that we we see in uh, Greco-Roman and in Jewish mythologies um, in the Second Temple period. Um, we even have some Christian myth. Um, I'm thinking of things like the gospel of the cross uh, mm-hmm. the, the the gospel of the cross is one of the apocryphal gospels the cross floats up in the air and it talks <laughs> um <laughs> the, there's no floating crosses flying through the room you know right uh, you know and in a in a natural reading i think to the layperson th- this passage would not come across as a parable but when you get into the nitty-gritty of uh, this kind of academic work, you have to define it so that you know precisely what you're talking about and what fits with what. Um, so it is, it's absolutely not a parable story. It fits the hallmark of the gospel miracle stories. Um, it just so happens it's one of the exorcism miracle stories. To that vein, I'd also say the form of a story does not determine the truth and falsehood of the story. Right. So something can be a poetic narrative, uh, an epic poem, right, and be true. Yeah, profoundly true, perhaps. Or it can be false, or it can have neither true or false. It can be neither true nor false. Mm. Um, so if I'm writing a haiku and the main point is to make you feel something, it's not going to have true, it's not going to be expressing a truth. Um, it's just, you know, yeah, going to try to make fit the rhythm and the scheme. Epic poetry or plays Julius Caesar by Shakespeare is reasonably historically reliable we sure. would say yeah you know it's it not... follows the basic kind of arc yeah you could the, the arc is generally true there are some places where it's a little fast and loose sure and then there are places everyone agrees that julius caesar has been stabbed 27 times <laughs> yeah Who, whoever the person was who stood around the body counting the knife holes uh, after the emperor is dead, who had nothing better to do than count knife holes in the emperor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe that CSI uh, Miami guy been... with the sunglasses traveled through time and, you know, had some witty, you know, somebody wanted their Julius Caesar salad chopped. Yeah! <laughs> bow, bow, bow. Sorry. So, same thing with, with the... <laughs> with <laughs> sorry go ahead <laughs> same thing com- same thing coming to the to the life of Christ there are some places where there may be adaptation that the gospel authors have uh to fit the form mm-hmm. that they include that they specifically intend to include that are his- that is specific historical details yeah we're getting an interested history we get commentary on the histories we're going through but the but the truth of the event is the truth of the event right so it can be a limerick it can be an epic poem it can be a news report it can be a gospel genre doesn't make it true or false right and people who want to say well the gospels are myth or the gospels are this this or that genre because it's this genre Mm. they they're not being fair or honest with the criticism against their position yeah but we could point to even a 
perhaps a, a silly but a vivid example from the modern day when people watch Saturday Night Live and they see one of these political sketches where um, a character who's a parody of a, a real-life politician or what have you, um, that character spouts off a line that they really said at a press conference or at a an interview or on Twitter or whatever. Um, just because everything around it is a comedy sketch doesn't change the the truth we find in that moment. I mean, you know, you watch a comedy sketch about, you know, somebody in pop culture, whether that's a politician or not, um, you laugh and you go, oh, that's so true. That's so true. Um, that That's that's real and has meaning. They're finding that there is truth there. Even if it's something as silly as Celebrity Jeopardy and they're watching, you know, their favorite actor or actress or musician or whoever being um, played to such a silly degree that it's it's cracking everybody up. There's still something true about you know, whoever that person is, uh, represented in, of all things, a late-night comedy sketch. Agreed. <laughs> you do? <laughs> Thank you for affirming my point. Uh, I didn't go too crazy with the uh, SNL as an example to help us think about church history. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, no, I, I had a good okay. time writing that paper, and... Um, uh, you know, doing this podcast lets us do some more history, but I also want to, would like to get into more writing of it as well. So uh, we want to recommend some books that we find to be good history. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're picking some things that are from a couple different perspectives. Uh, some of these are going to be narrow focused. Some of these are going to be more broad. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these are different uh, target audiences. We just think these are good history books. Yeah, exactly. These are these are good examples of historiography. They're uh, in some cases uh, fun. <laughs> um, so these are less academic, uh, academically minded on the process of history writing. And more, like you said, Johnny Mac, just examples of history writing that you and I have appreciated. Well, mind if I grab one first? Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, this is, I for some reason like sets, especially ones <laughs> that are even. Uh, this is an... <laughs> they look nice on the shelf. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is an older set, and uh, I have to admit, one of the authors of this set was a professor at uh, Golden Gate before I got there. Um, but uh, the series is The Makers of the Modern Theological Mind. Mm. Um, there may be 150 page biographies of uh, modern uh, uh biblical scholars or theologians mm. uh, they're fair they're pretty easy reads mm -hmm. um, and pretty compelling uh, i've been working through in what little spare time i have and i probably ought to be using that on the dissertation um <laughs> through uh <laughs> Uh, Kierkegaard, uh, the biography mm. on Kierkegaard mm -hmm. set. Um, it's, it's just a nice, nice biography. Well, I've got one that's, um, a little, a little less church, uh, related. Uh, I'll just get this one out of the way before we get into the others. Um, anyone who knows me, or at least knows me well, is aware of my uh, deep, deep affection for the writings and life of J.R.R. Tolkien um, ever since junior high. And uh, so I've read more than one biography about him, I confess it. And um, 
I've read a couple of really <laughs> good ones. Uh, there's this there's this large large one with a black cover who's um it's it's packed away and I I I didn't dig it out. It's a good one, but uh one that was especially interesting is called Tolkien and the Great War written by John Garth. This is a book that specifically digs into how J.R. Tolkien's experience as a British soldier in World War I affected his his writing, most especially his writing about his uh, Middle Earth books and other stories. Uh, so that one's that one's fun, and it gives um, it gives us a good example on this list of something that's not trying to do an end to end biography, birth to death. Um, but rather focuses in uh, more narrowly on a particular aspect of a person's life. Another history book that's worth reading. Um, this is an institutional history. Mm. Um, this is not going to be as riveting as some of the other um, ones on our list at places. Uh, but there are some places there it gets to have a bit of intrigue. Uh, the History of Fuller Seminary, written by George Marsden. Uh, mm. The title is Reforming Fundamentalism, Fuller Seminary, and the New Evangelicalism. It looks at the history of a particular institution, this time it's a school, um, mm. and goes through what it took to open the school finance the school run it uh and mm. the theological questions going on in managing the school it's a great read yeah he also wrote some really good biographies about jonathan edwards yeah he um anything by marsden uh you know read <laughs> yeah he uh he comes to he comes from a slightly different perspective than i do um but i i do i did enjoy his his edwards biographies especially uh but i'm going to go ahead with uh my next recommendation which is uh fuller seminary is a contemporary seminary and uh this book is about a relatively uh uh contemporary person uh he only died about um goodness about 10 years ago i think not too contemporary, <laughs> but yeah. he lived in the 20th and the 21st centuries. Um, this book is called Love Worth Finding, The Life of Adrian Rogers and His Philosophy of Preaching, uh, written by Joyce Rogers, his wife. So this is a, it's a biography about uh, his origins some, but the bulk of it is about uh, his adulthood and uh, his his family life and ministry service and kind of the back and forth behind the scenes of 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 those mostly the 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 ministry service of course and and the preaching written from the perspective of his wife so it's it gives a lot of personal insight that uh, these other biographies we've mentioned so far. Uh, simply couldn't. Uh, Marsden wrote wonderful biographies of Edwards. He lived hundreds of years after the guy. Um, the same problem for the the Tolkien scholar. Um, you know, he may love Tolkien's works and be a, gr a great historian, but he didn't know Professor Tolkien. Um, but this is this one is is personal, so it's semi autobiographical for Joyce Rogers, but. Um, her focus is on um, putting forward what life and ministry was like for Adrian Rogers. For any anyone listening who doesn't know who that is, Adrian Rogers was um, a winsome, charismatic, in the personality sense, not the denominational sense, um, powerful. Southern Baptist preacher, um, primarily known for the work that he did in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and so it's it's not that long. It's 
a couple hundred pages. Um, and at the end of the book, it has a question and answer uh, interview, basically, between Adrian Rogers and this guy who wrote a dissertation about this very subject, um, about his philosophy of preaching. Anyway, it's, it, it's uh, definitely worth reading just to get a, a sense about that man and the his, uh, a piece of Southern Baptist history. He's a really important figure in Baptist history and Baptist life. Absolutely. The next book, again, I like sets, especially <laughs> when they're even. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe I have a problem of collecting things. Uh, <laughs> You're going to be featured on the next episode of Hoarders. <laughs> Uh, this is a series by Voice of the Martyrs mm -hmm. uh, titled Kids of Courage. Uh, there are a number of stories of influential Christian missionaries, predominantly, mm -hmm. um, or uh, important Christians who did work to help uh, further, co further the cause of Christ uh, and care for their uh, friends and neighbors. Uh, I have in my hand uh, the, the story of St. Nicholas, more than a, red, a reindeer in a red suit. Um, <laughs> does it talk about punching Arius in that one? <laughs> it does leave out the punching of Arius, I believe. <laughs> what? That's kind of a shame. <laughs> Oh, I stand corrected. There is a there's a section in the beginning of the book that gives a more uh, a longer explanation in more adult um dis a more adult appropriate description. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is in there. And wow. Does it include like a an image that's like a parody of that famous Captain America comic cover where he's punching Hitler? Uh, Please say yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am now paging through this again in case I missed. <laughs> in the book, he it says that he slapped Nicholas in the face. Uh, sorry. It says that Nicholas slapped uh, Arius in the face Wow! Uh, because he thought uh, Arius was making fun of Jesus. Um, and there is a large picture of that. Uh, <laughs> wow. So you got to text I that to me. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I forgot that. <laughs> um, but there are... There's the life of uh, several of the apostles. Mm. Um, the the pictures are bright and colorful. The mm. words are uh, appropriate for easy uh, early readers. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to expose your children to you know, Santa slapping a, <laughs> a, a heretic, right? Uh, that's your parental choice. Uh, <laughs> Calvin will hear about uh, Arius getting slapped by St. Nicholas, and then he's not going to want to sit on Santa's lap next Christmas. Uh, <laughs> you know, a, a Nicholas punching Arius is definitely my favorite Christmas carol. <laughs> anyway, Kids of Courage series, I do recommend the series. It's, it's good history. Um, hmm. If we... If we value history, we ought to show our kids that history is more than just boring names and dates. Right. But there's a compelling narrative, and it's never too early to start reading historical works to your kids. Right. Right. Uh, another uh, children's book that we have on this list is my suggestion, uh, although Jonathan is well aware of this book as well. Um, it's called Church History ABCs, edited by Stephen J. Nichols and Ned Bustard. This book is, it, it's an ABC book, 
so you can you can use it with kids uh, as young as as you want, but each page also comes with a little more detail, something memorable about the person, and then at the end of the book, it gives these neat um, uh, paragraph, maybe two paragraph length little blurbs about each person represented in the the book. So there have been occasions where uh, my kids want me to read the book to them, and I'll just say one of the names on the sly out loud before we open it up. I'll say Lady Jane Grey, and they've responded Queen for nine days because they learned it from re repeating this book over and over. And so now they've begun to understand this uh, Protestant queen of, uh, of England who was beheaded for the Christian faith because she wouldn't submit to uh, a popish way of looking things. Um, and uh, they can learn about uh, Francis Xavier on the page for the letter X and um, the missionary work that he did and, and so on. So each page is a different figure from history past. Uh, John Calvin is the letter C. Martin Luther is the letter L and um, uh, Augustine, of course, gets the honor of the letter A, and his mother Monica gets the letter M. Um, we were talking about them earlier about Gerald Bray's chapter. Um, so it's it's a neat book that I've I used as just a a straight up ABCs book with my kids when they were very little, but uh, as they grow, I'm using it to talk to them about more of this other data that is in the book as well and, and we then can uh, only, we go can ahead. only hope that one of them has inspired to be an augustinian scholar uh, and fall down that rabbit hole <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> uh the last book that uh we have on the list is actually the the namesake for the publishing house that put out that kids of courage series this book is called the voice of the martyrs uh, it's an old book now. It's uh, several hundred years old, written originally by John Fox. That's Fox with an E on the end. Um, but you can find it also in updated versions. Uh, they did an updated version just around the year 2000 that added more history to the end of it, essentially. And I believe they've updated it again since then, sometime in the last five to ten years. Um probably seven years or so <laughs> two to two to seven years depending on when they did it anyway the voice of the martyrs is a history book that presents stories of the martyrs of the christian faith from the first century so starting with the apostles up to john fox's own day and then in these updated editions they tell uh, additional uh m martyr stories from uh, after John Fox published this book up to uh, whenever the, the latest edition is. Uh, I was originally exposed to it through an edition that came out around the year 2000 that uh, accounted for uh, all kinds of stories in the intervening period between John Fox and the modern day. Um, that's a very, very compelling book. It may be the most compelling book on this list uh, that we're recommending to you today. Uh, if you have not read it yet, and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I strongly recommend that you read it through at least once. Um, I've read it three times myself, and will read it again in the future, probably multiple times, Lord willing. Um, it's a powerful book. If you are inclined to read um, books online uh, Christian Classics Ethereal Library mm. that's C-C-E-L dot org that's right. uh, has this on their website right that's the original version is that isn't that correct uh, yes yes it is so it's, I think it is uh, it's still a valuable edition um, but it wouldn't I don't think it's the version that has the updated um, additional stories from after the, the life of John Fox. Um, 
But that's it. Uh, for me, do you have any other uh, book recommendations, Johnny Mac? I think that's what I have for this week. I mean, there's lots of good biographies and history books, right? Like, we could be here all day. <laughs> but we should probably yes. wrap it up. We're, it's already a, a, an extra long episode. If you have any questions, uh, say you've read these and uh, you want to know more, well, what else would you recommend reading if you want to go down on the reading list mm -hmm. or something that you think you'd like us to go into more detail or clarification? Or you want to tell me, no, you've you've read Augustine's life all wrong. <laughs> uh, those scenes aren't uh, critiquing Monica uh, or the uh, Donatists or North African Christianity. Uh Feel free to email us at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. That's churchhistorypodcast, no dots, no spaces, at gmail.com. That's right. You can also tweet us at Oral History Pod or contact us on our Facebook page, uh, which is facebook.com slash oral history of the church, uh, to hit us up with questions or comments. Um, we are are uh, happy to take your questions in any of those three avenues, and we check them pretty regularly. Uh, so, so do drop us a line if you have questions or comments about anything going on here. Um, also, we don't normally shill for this, but uh, since it's the last episode of this volume, would you give us a rating or a review if you've enjoyed any of this? Would you please uh, do that for us on whatever uh, the platform is that you use to listen to us? Um, or if you just listen to us through the, the, the links that we put up on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, would you head over to iTunes or somewhere else and just give us a, a, a starred rating and, and maybe write a review about what you appreciated about what we've done here? Uh, it helps other people know that there's something going on here in this direction and and this is what we like about it because they might like that stuff too and it helps them to 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 make that choice and we don't want to you know beg you for it every episode but since we're wrapping it up here today I, I would like to ask you if you if you were so inclined we would very much appreciate you doing that for us speaking of iTunes if you've got your iTunes open you may want to check out our companion podcast Saints Gone Before mm -hmm. uh, on Monday, February 13th, we will have the conclusion of Martin Luther's Concerning Christian Liberty. Uh, in case you and your significant other want to uh, snuggle up a, as Valentine's Day comes up to think about the liberty of uh, the Christian, if that gets your, your fire going. Uh, wow. Wow. That's all I can say, Jonathan. Wow. I'm amazed at this. <laughs> Catherine uh, Von Bora saw something in, in Martin Luther. I want to think that it was his writings. <laughs> it could be. She loved him for his brain. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Saints Gone Before is uh, covering... Uh, documents well not covering reading again it's an audiobook podcast if you are unfamiliar with it um where we read just the documents of history past and we're celebrating over there the 500th anniversary of the protestant reformation this year by reading those kinds of texts so you can hop on over there every monday to get something related to the reformation as of this coming monday we'll have two full documents from martin luther available as well as the Schleitheim Confession, which comes from the Radical Reformation wing of the Protestant Reformation. But uh, as of right now, this is the end of Volume 2. We made it, Jonathan. We finished another volume. <laughs> Feels pretty good. I like it. I'm happy about it. Uh, but we also get to announce Volume 3. Johnny Mac, why don't you, why don't you tell us w what's going on with Volume 3? In light of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, uh, we date the start of the Protestant Reformation at the uh, 
nailing of the 95 theses to the Wittenberg uh, door. Right. Uh, we will be looking at the Lutheran wing of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there's multiple wings and streams of the, the Reformation. We want to do uh, justice to uh, Martin Luther and his heritage. So it's going to focus on that mm -hmm. segment of the Reformation. And we will be releasing that this July. So uh, keep your, we're going to be going on a bit of a break for this, but keep your, your eyes out for the return of uh, volume three. That's right. That's right. So keep your subscriptions live. And uh, we, we promise we will not uh, bother you in the interim with a bunch of other extra stuff. We're going to spend that time getting ready, trying to make it good. This time around, we talked history writing. Next time, we're going to talk some history. We're going to get into some stories about the life and times of Mr. Martin Luther. Well, Jonathan, I, last chance, um, man. You got anything else to, to share with us before we sign off? Adam Christman will return <laughs> in the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> do -do 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 -do. <laughs> Get, I've get watched that. way too much James Bond. Yeah, let's get that guitar riff going, though. I like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's been a lot of fun. It's exciting to wrap up another season with you, man. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Uh -huh.